this is Dr. Alex Vasquez. Today in my advanced basics program I'm going to talk about protein and amino acids. I also call this Nutrition 101 Cubed. Today's topic is NAC for mTOR inhibition. We're going to focus this conversation in rheumatology. Next time we'll extend this conversation to talk about uh, psychiatry. And here is one of my more recent mTOR diagrams. As you can see here, mTOR is pretty much in the middle. Upstream, we have mitochondrial dysfunction, especially mitochondrial hyperpolarization, which can be triggered by bacterial endotoxin, or LPS. That also activates a different pathway, which also culminates in the activation of mTOR. mTOR then goes on to promote cancer growth and autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, as I will discuss in this conversation and others in the future, as well as in the recent past, where I've also talked about this in some online webinars. So the advanced basics concept is basically just to start with a basic idea. In this case, we're going to talk about uh, N-acetylcysteine and amino acid that's available in supplemental form, and then basically take the conversation to the next level for a more sophisticated understanding of the mechanisms of action of interventional therapeutic nutrition, as well as, of course, functional medicine. My goal is to keep this pretty short and sweet, about three to five articles, about 15 slides in about 15 minutes. And the goal, of course, uh, of this presentation, along with all of my educational material, is to distribute important information and to basically wrestle with the information so that you and I and we all come out stronger for the effort. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the famous quote, kind of the catchphrase from Friedrich Nietzsche, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Uh, obviously, Nietzsche said many brilliant things beyond that, uh, but that's the one that most people have heard. The following slide contains my notices and copyright information, trademarks, disclosures, and the scope of this presentation. At any time, of course, you can always pause the video, read everything word for word if you'd like, but otherwise I'm just going to provide the highlights. So let's talk about NAC in acetyl or in acetylcysteine. This is uh, an amino acid. Uh, L-cysteine is a non-essential amino acid, sometimes also described as a conditionally essential amino acid because sometimes people make enough, but if they're under stress or if they're exposed to toxins, they might need to take more in the form of a supplement. We can distinguish between the effects of NAC, glutathione, and NF-kappa B inhibition, even though, of course, with NAC, some uh, overlap and continuum exists there because NAC has benefits in and of its own. Some of those benefits are derived from its conversion to, in this case, GSH or glutathione, which is an important antioxidant and modifier of gene transcription. And then some of the benefits of NAC are derived from its ability to inhibit NF-kappa B. So we have to look at those separately, but we also have to appreciate that they pretty much exist on a continuum. For example, pretty much anything that inhibits NF-kappa B is going to have an antioxidant effect because NF-kappa B activation, by definition, is not simply pro-inflammatory, but it's also pro-oxidant. So we'll talk about these, and when necessary, I will separate them. We'll talk about these on the following slide. Adverse effects of NAC are very minimal mostly gastrointestinal discomfort, nausea, heartburn. Some people also report headaches, but that's pretty rare. It's a dose-response relationship, um, especially with intravenous use. We see some conversation about uh, histaminic or uh, vasodilatory anaphylactic type reactions, but that's mostly with IV use. Uh, I've certainly never heard of that from uh, PO or oral use. Administration is basically uh, oral. Uh, Obviously, that means by mouth with water, uh, in divided doses, uh, 500 milligrams three times a day, up to 1,500 milligrams three times a day, I think is very reasonable. Uh, for general antioxidant benefits, or even, for example, preventing like common cold or influenza, we might use uh, 500 milligrams three times a day. That's fine. For more aggressive treatments, we certainly go uh, up to the range of about 1,500 milligrams three times a day. That's what the current recommendations are per the research that I will show you in just a moment. Now let's run through some quick clinical applications for NAC. Uh, it is a mucolytic agent, so NAC contains sulfur groups. Uh, those sulfur groups are able to break or dissolve uh, or dissociate disulfide bonds in mucus, and that helps to thin the mucus, uh, which of course is important for people who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or cystic fibrosis or pneumonia, for example. We want to break up that mucus help basically dissolve it and get it to move out so that people don't uh, have respiratory uh, challenges because of the mucus. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, it is a glutathione precursor. For that reason, it is used in various cases of what, what we might call chemical hepatitis. Uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen overdose is, of course, the classic example. NAC is a direct antioxidant, independent from its ability to form the more potent uh, antioxidant, glutathione. NAC is also an antiviral agent. Uh, it's immunoprotective or immunorestorative. For example, if you look at patients with HIV, they usually have glutathione and cysteine deficiency. When they receive NAC, they experience some degree of uh, immunorestoration, as I call it. Uh, through the provision of cysteine generally, but specifically the increased uh, production of glutathione. Uh, as I mentioned before, NF-kappa B is inhibited by NAC. I think that's pretty self-explanatory uh, at this level of conversation. Uh, NAC has also been used in some cases of arsenic poisoning. Uh, I recall reading many, many years ago, actually to be exact, it was about 16 years ago, uh, one case of a man who had uh, tried to commit suicide by consuming ant poison, he was taken to the hospital, a couple of remedies were given to him, nothing worked, uh, and what they ultimately used was NAC, and that did work, and it did save his life. Psychiatric uses we will talk about next time. What we're going to focus on right now is the inhibition of mTOR for the anti-rheumatic effects, and also, to, by extension, of course, mTOR also plays a role in cancer, so if we inhibit mTOR with NAC, that would be expected to have an anti-cancer benefit as well. NAC is also cardioprotective. It lowers homocysteine uh, by about 45% and LP little a, as we call it, by about 70%. Uh, NAC is also vasodilatory via prostacycline. And uh, many of us know that it is renoprotective as well, uh, causes efferent uh, arterial vasodilation, also increases production, as we've already said, of glutathione, uh, and that helps to protect the kidneys, especially when people are undergoing um, radio contrast studies. So why is mTOR important now? Uh, as usual, just like with mitochondria a few years ago, uh, mTOR has become important to us now because we have new research and new insights. We also know that, of course, many people overeat, under-exercise, and have nutritional deficiencies and microbial excesses. All of these contribute to inflammation and sustained hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia, and all of that together drives mTOR activity. So as our phenotype changes with more obesity, more hyperglycemia, more hyperinsulinemia, we're going to see more mTOR-related diseases. Also, because of lax and irresponsible regulation of the chemical industry, we are increasingly burdened with chemicals. So some chemicals, for example, like BPA and methylparabene, activate mTOR directly. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's also activated by inflammation, overeating, excess glucose, and excess insulin. All of that activates mTOR, and then mTOR takes us downstream to pain, inflammation, and cancer. And because of all of the above, hyperglycemia and toxicity and microbes, we basically have a perfect storm for inflammation and autoimmunity and severe chronic pain in addition to cancer. A few more details about mTOR. mTOR is basically a protein that orchestrates cellular programs for survival and enhanced uh, immune or inflammatory responses. So again, I think of mTOR as being kind of the conductor of an orchestra. It just happens to be an orchestra of programs or gene genetic responses gene expression to basically drive uh, inflammatory responses, cell immortalization, which could be a good thing in some cases. For example, if you're fighting an infection, you don't want your immune cells to die in the middle of fighting that infection. You want them to be immortal, but you don't want them to be immortal for years and years, in which case they could spill over into autoimmunity or uh, in this case, cancer. mTOR also drives obesity and diabetes and also contributes to certain uh, neurologic programming in the brain that can result in chronic pain. mTOR activators include glucose, insulin, signals for growth, and nutrient excess, mitochondrial dysfunction, especially mitochondrial hyperpolarization, inflammation, and of course there we see a vicious cycle, I'll show you that in just a moment, uh, and toxic chemicals as I already mentioned before. BPA is found in many plastics and canned foods and parabenes uh, in foods and cosmetics. Clinical relevance again, inflammation, autoimmunity, cancer, and for those of us who are trying to look at things positively, we could look at inhibiting mTOR as a way to promote wellness or longevity. 
So what is mTOR? Let's look at it on another level. Uh, what is mTOR and how did it get a cool but meaningless name? mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. mTOR is a protein. Again, it's an enzyme that phosphorylates other proteins and so it's kind of the master conductor of certain patterned responses. Sometimes the M stands for mechanistic, sometimes it stands for mammalian depending on which article you are reading. Uh, rapamycin is an antimicrobial substance produced by soil microorganisms. It was later found to bind to this protein and block its actions and as is very common in the drug world when they find a drug product that binds to a protein they usually end up naming the protein after the drug. So in this case we end up with mammalian target of rapamycin. Now other things also uh, inhibit uh, mTOR and also start with R. So we could have renamed it for natural products and natural responses. For example, uh, resveratrol blocks the mTOR pathway. So we could have called this mammalian uh, target of resveratrol. We could have called it uh, mammalian target of um, R lipoic acid, for example, because R lipoic acid also blocks the same pathway. Uh, and I've talked about this in a little digital book that I published called Mastering mTOR. Uh, you know, this, like I said, it's a, kind of a cool name, but it's also pretty meaningless. Mammalian is obviously implied by the fact that we're treating humans. Mechanistic, all targets are mechanisms, so that's redundant. Uh, target is okay. Uh, usually small words like of would not be included within an acronym, so that's uh, not needed there. And again, the R could stand for rapamycin, it could stand for R lipoic acid. It could stand for resveratrol. It could stand for restrictive diets because fasting also helps to block mTOR's action. And it could also stand for, uh, as I mentioned before, kind of like detoxification or in this case, ridding the body of uh, toxic chemicals. Uh, when we look at experiments where mTOR has been blocked, we see anti-inflammatory effects, immunosuppressive effects in terms of blocking uh, transplant rejection. That's one of the uses of this drug. We also see anti-cancer effects, and we see a general uh, longevity promotion uh, effect. Activation of mTOR, again, inflammation, autoimmunity, cell growth, proliferation, resistance to death signals. Uh, in the short term, that could be a good thing. Again, if you want to support your immune uh, vitality, so to speak, during the middle of an infection, you don't want those cells to die. You want them to resist the death signals that they're surrounded by. Uh, however, you don't want that to, to go on for months and months and years and years. Uh, immortalization of cells, of course, is consistent with cancer and autoimmunity. Uh, and as I mentioned just a second ago, mTOR activation also promotes adipogenesis and lipogenesis. So now let's look at this in a graphic format. Uh, mitochondrial hyperpolarization is one of the triggers of mTOR activation. Once mTOR gets activated, it promotes inflammation and that triggers more mitochondrial hyperpolarization. So you see here, obviously, a vicious cycle. Things that can trigger mitochondrial hyperpolarization include bacterial endotoxin, oxidative stress, especially nitric oxide, uh, inflammation, and NF-kappa B activation. mTOR activation can also occur directly again from uh, inflammation, chemicals, and uh, signals that uh, indicate nutrient excess, such as hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia. Those trigger more inflammation. Inflammation can also be triggered through the topics I've discussed in my Inflammation Mastery and Find Sex Protocol. Again, mTOR activation, pain, inflammation, and cancer. Let's look at another graphic representation of this. As you can see here in the bottom left, we've got mTOR activation leading to changes in gene transcription, which ultimately cause activation of Th17 cells, and that promotes autoimmunity. We also see increased cytokine elaboration that drives B cells and T cells, which also contributes to the autoimmune condition. And making things even worse, we see Th17 cell activation here, but we also see that mTOR blocks the activation generation of these T regulatory cells by suppressing the tr gene transcription factor, FOXP3. So regardless of whether you take this route or this route, you basically end up with immune imbalance because you're gonna end up with too many Th17 cells here and not enough of the T reg cells here. So obviously you can use certain protocols. Uh, I've developed an autoimmune protocol that I call functional inflammology. You can use that protocol here. It's also described in another book that I've written called Naturopathic Rheumatology and another one called Functional Medicine Rheumatology. 
uh, all of those kind of summarize the same information. They're just different packagings of the same. We can use the autoimmune protocol here. We can use nutritional immunomodulation here, and we can use an antiviral protocol here because mTOR also activates the transcription of certain endogenous retroviruses, which we also know contribute to autoimmunity. So we've got some problems here and we've got some solutions, but what we're focusing on right now is mTOR itself. Again, when mTOR gets activated, it promotes autoimmunity, inflammation, and tissue damage, and that same inflammation also activates mTOR, so you definitely see a vicious cycle there. Let's look at what we can do with NAC in this conversation. Here's a quick case using NAC in the treatment of SLE nephritis. This is just a case report. Uh, NAC 1800 milligrams per day was proven safe in this, again, one case report. The patient was able to taper off of prednisone. Urine protein decreased from 2 plus down to 1 plus, so that showed an actual improvement in kidney function. And you can see some of that data here. She no longer complained of fatigue and was able to return to work. And her disease status changed from active to inactive. All of that with a simple nutritional supplement, NAC, 1800 milligrams per day. All of these achievements, I'm sure we all appreciate as clinicians, are excellent by any standard and even better when they can be achieved at low cost with excellent safety. Let's look at another case series here. Here we've got a uh, patient group of about 40 patients. NAC again at 1800 milligrams was proven to be safe and provide modest benefit and some uh, clinical and biochemical benefits. In my opinion, the dose here was uh, too low, especially when we look at the next research by Lay, uh, published in 2012. So in this study, first of all, they used higher doses. You'll notice they used 4,800 milligrams per day. So that's about 1,500 milligrams, 1,600 milligrams, three times per day. Uh, and what they showed here is that it blocked uh, mTOR and provided major clinical benefit. This was published by the American College of Rheumatology and Arthritis and Rheumatology, September of 2012. The title of the article is, N-acetylcysteine reduces disease activity by blocking mammalian target of rapamycin in T-cells from systemic lupus erythematosus patients. Now let's go through some of the summary that I've provided. Uh, I consider this to be a major study. They use NAC 1600 milligrams three times per day by mouth. What they showed here was significant suppression of mTOR, as you can see here by the quote. NAC was found to be safe and it improved disease activity and fatigue by profoundly blocking mTOR and expanding the FOXP3 positive uh, T cell population. Those are the T regulatory cells that I mentioned previously. And what we look at here in these charts is a pretty profound reduction in the activity of mTOR shown by both of these uh, methods. Now you can see here that we see some rebound effect uh, at visit number five and that's because the patients had stopped taking NAC for a month and so after a month you start to see some uh, return to so-called normal activity or hyperactivity in this case. But you can see very clearly that in all cases the NAC was able to suppress mTOR hyperactivity. And I think that's, a, a, that's an appropriate way to phrase it. We are suppressing hyperactivity and trying to make that activity more normal. We're not necessarily suppressing immune function. What was noted here was a dose-response relationship. Lower doses were not as effective. Another group within the same study got uh, 2400 milligrams rather than uh, 4800 milligrams and the people who got 2400 milligrams had much less benefit than the group that received a total of 4800 milligrams so again 1500 milligrams or 1600 milligrams uh, three times per day I think is very very reasonable and uh, again was shown to be very excellent here excellent safety and very impressive cost effectiveness the authors contrasted NAC treatment, which costs about $300 per year, maybe $200 per year, with the cost of the anti-rheumatic drugs, which is about $22,000 per year. So you're contrasting $22,000 a year with $200 or $300 per year. Uh, very impressive study here and very uh, assertive conclusions by the authors. Let's look at some perspectives and counter arguments here. Uh, I consider this to be a breakthrough treatment for lupus patients, specifically with applications to other autoimmune conditions. The mechanism NAC inhibition of mTOR is crystal clear and was well proven in the previous study that we just looked at. Uh, this treatment addresses the basic pathophysiology of lupus, which has to do with mTOR hyperactivation 
a deficiency of T regulatory cells and the antinuclear antibodies themselves. Antinuclear antibodies in lupus are not simply the laboratory marker, they are pathogenic in and of themselves. So these pathogenic antibodies, again, are the laboratory standard for the evaluation of lupus, but they are also directly pathogenic. They contribute to immune complexes that eventually cause the vasculitis, nephritis, dermatitis, and arthritis that we classically see in lupus patients. The above mechanisms are not exclusive uh, of other benefits, including antiviral benefits, especially the inhibition of endogenous retrovirus activation, enhanced glutathione, and enhanced detoxification. So the counter argument could be that, well, maybe you're just suppressing immune function with this nutritional supplement, and that's absolutely not correct. For example, if you look at uh, some of these studies that I'll show you in just one second, uh, they will show you that NAC is obviously not immunosuppressive. NAC has proven benefit in the treatment of viral illnesses. If NAC were immunosuppressive, then it would increase rather than decrease the risk of viral infections. So for example, you can see that NAC is very useful in the treatment of HIV. It's also useful in the prevention of influenza. So if NAC were at all uh, immunosuppressive, then we would see increases in disease activity in HIV and uh, other viral illnesses. And we in fact see the exact opposite of that, which is precisely why I have included NAC in my antiviral and immune nutrition strategy. Furthermore, uh, NAC is also used in patients who have cystic fibrosis uh, and who are at constant risk for pulmonary infections, mostly bacterial infections. So let's summarize that one more time from a uh, somewhat academic standpoint. We're going to look at this from the perspective of medical ethics and clinical decision making. The four pillars of medical ethics are beneficence. So we see that NAC suppresses mTOR, it increases FOXP3 expression and Treg immunotolerance. It increases glutathione and antioxidant defenses. It suppresses viral replication, improves mood and energy according to that one case, which I think is a very excellent representative case example. And it's also cardioprotective. So we see a lot of benefit from using NAC. We don't see hardly any adverse effects, um, rather benign supplement related uh, adverse effects like nausea, heartburn, rare headaches. Um, and those are really not medically significant uh, in terms of comparing this to other drug therapies that are available. Uh, when we look beyond non-malfeasance to autonomy, uh, NAC of course does provide patients the ability to access a safe and effective treatment and, and to reduce their dependency on other uh, either antiviral drugs or anti-rheumatic drugs. When we talk about distributive justice, obviously we see that NAC is far less expensive than the anti-rheumatic drugs and it is of course widely available. Finally, my perspective is that NAC should be used routinely uh, and if you have concerns about it, you can always start with a low dose and increase your dose thereafter. So what we're going to talk about next time when we talk about mTOR and psychiatry is connecting mTOR with microglial activation in brain diseases. I think this is a really fascinating topic. You see some conversation now about using NAC in psychiatry. You see another study here using NAC in children who have autism. Uh, and that's because, of course, it helps to reduce the level of brain inflammation that we see in children with autism. But talking about the whole conversation about brain inflammation or what has been called previously in this 1994 article, Brain on Fire, uh, I think this is a really fascinating topic. And so it's one that I'm exploring uh, with relation to mTOR, immune dysfunction, and of course, uh, the central nervous system driver of this, which is microglial activation. Microglial activation contributes to excess glutamate deficiency of neuroprotective and neurotrophic factors. It also causes intracerebral inflammation, oxidative stress, depletion of neuroprotective antioxidants. That leads to hyperexcitation. Uh, clinically, what we see is pain, depression, fatigue, migraine headaches, neurodegeneration. Of course, that affects brain function as it does in autism. And then that's how we end up with this picture of basically the brain being on fire. As you can see with the arrow going back to the left, this becomes a vicious cycle. So that microglial activation causes hyperglutaminergic excitatory neurotransmission that leads to uh, excitotoxicity and death of neurons. 
That's why it's called brain on fire is because they're basically burning out. But this becomes a vicious cycle because the hyperexcitation of those neurons also leads back to microglial activation. And that's why we see a vicious cycle here, sometimes referred to as brain on fire. So that was a rather quick conversation, but I think it was very interesting, at least in my opinion, connecting NAC with mTOR inhibition in rheumatology, and next time we will connect that with psychiatry. So stay tuned, and I'll have more for you soon.